Good morning. Good morning. If I don't make it up here, will you start without me? Somebody would jump up, right? We've got a volunteer in the back. Um, welcome to worship this morning. So glad to be with you here uh, at Faith this morning. Um, I know there's still some ice out on the roads and things, but what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. And this is indeed the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, announcements this morning. Uh, just a couple printed for you on the bulletin. That reminder about Meals on Wheels in February that we'll be helping with that. And there is a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center. Uh, also wanted to remind you, I didn't notice if how many or where the poinsettias are at, but there's maybe a few left here. If they uh, belong in your home, please take it with you today. Um, and for those who purchased and did not care to take one home, those are available to you as well. So, um, council meeting coming up on Wednesday. I'll, I'll throw out that reminder. And then I will ask if there are any other announcements for the good of the people this morning. Scott's got a mic in the back and we'll bring it to you if you've got anything you would like to share for announcements. Good for the people today. All right. Would you center your hearts and prepare for worship? Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Friends, let's sing some praise this morning. We're going to start with How Great Is Our God and move into What a Mighty God We Serve. Uh, for that first song, if you'd like to remain seated, and then the second song, if you're able to stand, I would encourage you to do so. Let's sing our praises together. Yeah. 
to greet one another this morning. of you that, that uh, have gotten to know me very well, you know that I, I really enjoy uh, given the opportunity to incorporate some humor and to share a story that might make you laugh, uh, especially um, sometimes those are the things you remember from a sermon, so I have to be tricky and sneak in the meaning, right? So um, I want to tell you a story today, but I, I wanted to put forward it's, it's not a humorous one today. It's a bit more sobering, um, but it is very impactful and it speaks to what we're talking about today. Um, it actually comes from an author named Erwin Lutzer who was written a letter, um, and he, he shared this letter written by a Christian who lived during Hitler's Germany, uh, who wrote the letter to this author to share his story. So I, I want to read it to you today. He says, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from all of that because what could anyone really do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and on each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We did become disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by because we realized it was carrying Jews like cattle in those train cars. Week after week, he writes, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear that sound because we knew that it would soon be followed by the cries of Jews en route to a death camp, and their screams tormented us. We also knew what time during the church service that train was coming. So when we heard the whistle blow, letting us know it was drawing closer, we would begin singing hymns. And by the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the scream still, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard those screams no more. He writes, that was a long time ago. Many years have passed. No one talks about it. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. He says, God, forgive me. Forgive all of us who have called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing. The word that I want to talk about today is the word complacent. And I suppose um, following that story, maybe you, you get a different feel for the word, but Typically, when we use the word complacent, it's, it's not, not a horrible word, right? If I said, you know, hey, that guy's a, a complacent person, you wouldn't say, well, that's evil, right? We, we don't really find it tremendously offensive. It's, maybe it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Um, we're kind of complacent about the word complacent. Not really good, not really bad. But what if I were to propose to you what if I told you that perhaps the greatest threat to our world today is a church full of complacent followers of Jesus? 
what if I framed it that way? I do not want the word complacent to be a word that is used when people are describing this church. I know we don't want to be complacent. We don't want to cover our ears and just gather together in our sanctuaries and sing more loudly as trains pass by or sirens. I don't know if you could hear it. <laughs> Maybe because, how many of you heard the siren? Should we pray about that right now? Let's do that. Lord, hearing that there is an emergency in our community, we pray that whomever is involved, whoever is answering that call to help, that you would be with them, that you would offer wisdom and guidance to those who need your care. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We don't want to be that church that listens to people screaming outside and pay no attention and do nothing, sing louder to avoid it. That is not what we want to do. That's not who we are. And you know, I, I will have some folks that think maybe um, the opposite of complacency is, is to be aggressive in, in a way that's almost hostile. Um, that if you're not cursing those who are against you, uh, if you're not raging against those who disagree with you, then somehow you're complacent. Um, there are people that feel that way too. That's not the example that Jesus has put out for us. That is not the kingdom that he came to bring. He didn't come to bring hostility, uh, and not because he was complacent, because he wasn't. He just came to bring a different kingdom. And in the kingdom that Jesus came to bring, you consider others better than yourselves. In the kingdom that Jesus came to bring, someone strikes you on one cheek and you turn the other as well. And you say, well, that sounds like Jesus is a pacifist. That sounds cowardly. Okay, we'll try it. Because it takes a lot of courage to turn the other cheek. In the kingdom that Jesus came to bring, if someone sues you for your shirt, you say, here's my coat as well. If they say, walk one mile, you say, I'm going to walk two. In the kingdom that Jesus came to bring you, bless those who curse you. You don't curse those who curse you. You bless those who curse you. You love your enemy. This is the kingdom that we're committed to. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is the kingdom that you are called to advance here. And I want to be clear, look, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, yes, you can speak up about your beliefs, your political point of view, especially in this country that we live in. You can speak up about opinions and ideologies that you disagree with. You can take a stand and you can make your case. Sure, you can do that. But the moment that you stop loving your enemies, the moment you start to curse those who disagree with you, you need to sit down and be quiet. I could be that pastor, right? That says the moment you start cursing your enemies, you need to sit down and shut your mouth. That is not the kingdom that Jesus came to bring. That is not the kingdom that he came to advance. And it's not just what you say, friends, it's the way you say. And it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. And it's not just the cause that you're committed to, it's the spirit of Christ that you are filled with. It is Jesus Christ that you represent. So you can do the right things. And you can have the right policies. But if you don't do that with the humility and the love and the compassion of Jesus, then you are better off staying on the sideline. We need the spirit of Christ. It is not just the cause that we are committed to, it is Christ that we are committed to, the way of Jesus Christ. So tomorrow, um, looking at my calendar this week, I, I recognize that Martin Luther King Jr. Day is, is coming up tomorrow. 
Martin Luther King Jr., he actually preached about this in some really powerful ways, that it's not just the cause, right? We don't want to just be committed to a cause. We want to be committed to the way that Jesus teaches. Love your enemies. Um, he was quoted, Martin Luther King Jr. quoted as saying, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. In one of his letters that would later be a publication, he wrote about how the early Christians changed the world, and he describes the early church uh, that we're gonna be looking at here in the book of Acts. He, he describes them as small in number, but big in commitment. Small in number, but big in commitment. They were committed to the way of Christ. And he writes about what he calls the gospel glow of early Christians. That's how the early church changed the world. It wasn't through their power or their position. It was through love and compassion that pointed people to Jesus. So here at Faith, we want to do something, right? We don't want to be complacent. But I do take that moment to clarify for you, and I ask, Please don't confuse humility and love with complacency. Jesus was not complacent. In the same way, don't confuse hostility or rage with commitment. We should always be modeling that example of Jesus and how we interact with others and what we do. So we're going to look at... Uh, a story in the book of Acts that demonstrates the difference between complacency and commitment. We're going to look at Acts chapters 4 and 5, a story of a couple who they, they start out as committed, but they become complacent. And that complacency has a way of leading them to really compromise their integrity. So a little context. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 4. I'll be starting in verse 32. And it says, All... The believers, that's how it starts out, with lots of unity. All of the believers were in one heart, were one in heart and mind, right? All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. That's who, how united that they, they, they were. Um, their church family was seen as one unit. Whatever I have is yours, whatever you have is mine. It says they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's the message of the early church. They're preaching Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. And the Bible says God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, there were no needy persons among them. It's one of the ways that you see the power of God at work through a church. They're taking care of people in need. There is no one in need because they're that unified. That's one of the evidences that God is at work in a church. And one of the ways it happened, it says, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sale, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So they're selling their property, bringing that money to the church, and using it for anyone who has need. And I, I want to point out a couple things as we think about moving from complacency to being committed. The early church demonstrated their commitment through what we would call sacrificial generosity. Um, commitment sac you know, is demonstrating for the, the community around them, that, that, that love, that compassion, that commitment is there by how they are showing their love for the needy, how they are making sure there are no needy. Sacrifice is defined as giving up something you love for something or someone else that you love more. I'll tell you, if you show me who or what you sacrifice for, I will show you who or what you are committed to. And Jesus is the one who made this connection for us. He talked a lot about money because money tells the story of your commitment. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, For wherever your riches are, wherever your treasures are, 
That's where your heart is going to be also. That is what you are committed to. Show me your bank account, where your money is going, and I will show you what's important to you. And the early church modeled their commitment through sacrificial generosity. <clears throat> the second thing I want to draw your attention to here in Acts 4 is they help people in need by giving through the church. So often we talk about giving to the church, don't we? Uh, we got to give my tithe, got to give to the church. I want the church to grow. I want the church to church, church, church. But we're not thinking about working through the church so much. I want to point that out because if you study church history, this is one of the factors in why the early church had such an impact on the world. It's because the believers came together and gave generously to help people in need. But they did it through the church. And in doing that through the church, it pointed people to Jesus. It connected people to a family, to a church family. So it's great if you as an individual see someone in need and you want to help out and, and they maybe notice that you've got Jesus in your life, that's great. Do that. But when we do that as a church, we have such a greater impact because we can bring people into our family in Christ. So in chapter 5 in the book of Acts, we read about a couple. Uh, again, we know that some, some of the people in the church would sell their land and their homes, and on occasion they would bring those proceeds to the church. And again, it's not that they didn't love their land or their homes. They did. They just loved the mission of the church more. So in Acts chapter 5, here's what we read about this couple. It says, there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, but he claimed it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. I read that to you again. He brought part of the money to the apostles, but he claimed it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Do you hear the problem there? Because the problem isn't, isn't that they didn't give all the money. It's not that. It's that they said they were going to give all the money and only gave part of it. The problem, it's, it's not about a dollar amount. It's not about how much a person gives. The issue was an issue of commitment. What they were doing is different than what they said they were going to do. Verse 4 tells us that Peter confronts Ananias about this. He says, how could you do this thing? You're not lying to us, but you're lying to God. He's saying it's not just us, it's, it's God you're lying to. It's, it's not just about supporting the church budget, right? It's God that you are withholding from. And we're going to see how seriously God takes the commitments that we make. Peter says, it's not just us, it's God you're lying to. Verse 5 says, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Yep, that's what it says. He fell down and died. And you can be like, wait, what? Like he gave, he gave money to the church and he died? That doesn't sound right. But it's not, it's not about that he gave some of the money. It's not about that. It's about the commitment he made. He said it was the full amount. It's about the commitment he made. It's about the community he was a part of. And God takes those things serious. Like Ananias, he's undermining the whole community as he does this. In verse 7, it says, About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price? Was this the amount here? Is that the price that you and your husband received for the land? He asked her, the money that you gave, is that the full amount that you received for the land? And she said, yes, that was the price. Peter says, how could the two of you even think about conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who carried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. And instantly, 
Anybody else reading along? So people will believe me, right? It says, instantly, she fell on the floor and died. Well, that seems extreme, doesn't it, friends? Nobody's laughing. Nobody's like, oh, that's a good one. She fell on the floor and died. Like, that seems a little dramatic, doesn't it? Especially if you've never heard this story before. Um, Like, this might help with our giving for a while, though, right? I gotta make sure you're with me here. It seems a little drastic, but really the message here is that we clearly underestimate how much this matters to God. We don't talk about this kind of stuff. We don't like to talk about money. We don't like to talk about the personal commitments that people make. That's their business, right? And yet Jesus talked a lot about it. Talked a lot about money because money tells the story of our commitment. Money has a way of testifying to what we're committed to. So Acts 5 gives us just a glimpse of this, this judgment with Ananias and Sapphira. And I want to draw your attention to verse 4 where Peter says to Ananias, how could you do a thing like this? It's not just us you're lying to. Now, he didn't get a chance to answer, but I think I understand. I do. I think it has a lot to do with complacency. Like, he, he got complacent. I imagine Ananias and Sapphira, when they're talking about this, when they first start having these ideas, and, and it's like, oh, we could keep some of the money and give some, and they're, and they're no, we're not going to do that, right? No, 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 that's a bad idea. I committed the full amount. I'm going to give the full amount. But then they start thinking about some of the different ways they could really use that money if they kept some of it for themselves. They have bills to pay. They have needs. And then they probably flip back the other way and say, well, we don't want to lose face, right, with our church community, so we committed to give the money from the sale. we got to give something. We'll just tell them this is how much we got, and we'll keep some for ourselves. What if we just give them part of it and we tell them it's all of it? It's complacency. It's complacency with the truth. Complacent with commitment. Complacent with a community that trusts you. That's, you're complacent with what matters to God. And I want to talk about this because I know that God is calling us out of a place of complacency. Get out of that. The challenge I struggle with is how do I call complacent people to not be complacent, right? Like, how do you do that? Uh, You're complacent about complacency, so you don't really care by definition about being complacent. That was a lot. How do we wake up from that? A lot of us strive for status quo, right? Just an even keel life, nothing real big dramatic up, nothing real big dramatic down. That's a nice place to be. But complacency, it's a feeling of indifference that just kind of settles in over a period of time. We just get used to the way things are. At first something disturbs you and you think, I need to do something about that. But over time you just begin to accept it. Something's broken. The light switch doesn't work, but there's one on the other side there. I need to fix that light switch, but there's another one. I'll just use the other one. I know I need to fix it, but it's not really hurting anything. You move into a house that has a train going behind it, and the first week in the house you can't sleep because all you think about and all you hear is that train going by. A few years down the road, you don't even notice the train anymore. Complacency also brings with it this inner voice that convinces you somebody else is going to do something. Somebody else will take care of it. In psychology, it's called the bystander effect. It's this idea that if you're sitting in a crowd of people, if you're aware that there are tens or hundreds or thousands of other people, you just think, well, it's not that I don't care about it, but somebody else will do it. Someone else will do something. Someone else. You know, someone else who has more time can serve on that 
committee. Someone else who has more money can give. Someone else will sponsor a child. Someone else will do something to stop human trafficking. Someone else will pick up trash or make a phone call or give a ride. Someone else will make sure that a victim of abuse has a safe place to stay. Somebody's doing that. Someone else will do something. That is complacency. It's often disguised also, you know, as procrastination. It's not that I'm not going to do something, I just can't do it right now. That's how the broken light switch stays broken for a year. I meant to do it, I'll do it when I have time. Someone else who has more time should fix that. Complacency. going to do something about it, just not right now. It's Ananias saying to Sapphira, hey, it's not so much a lie because we can always give more money to the church later. We can always do something about it later. Complacency is just this unhealthy and unaware self-satisfaction with your life. It's inaction when a situation calls for action. There's something that happened, you need to do something about it, but you're not doing anything. The alarm is going off, but you're not getting up. How many of you are great at getting up with an alarm clock? How many of you don't need an alarm clock because you wake up on your own? It happens when you get older. <laughs> How many of you have a snooze button? You use it more than once? Oh, is it because you didn't hear the alarm the first time or because you'll get up later? I was reading about a, an occupation, a job uh, that, that people held in the early 20th century um, in Britain, also in Ireland. And it's a job, it, it, a job where people who did this job were responsible to go by and knock on the doors of other people's homes in the community and wake them up in the morning. Um, alarm clocks were not common in most households because they were very expensive. They were also very unreliable. So these people, that was their job. And their job title, this is what they were called. I am not making it up. The person who did this job, they were called the knocker-upper. <laughs> and I know this service is recorded and I hope that particular soundbite does not get excluded from the context of this message. The knocker-upper, it's a really unfortunate name, isn't it? Um, Google it, friends. I'm, they were called the knocker-upper. Interesting addition to your resume. Shouldn't have said that either. Um, the knocker-upper, but that's, that is what they would do. They were, it was a job, like I said. They were paid to stay awake, to stay up, so they're up in the morning, and then they would go around and they would knock. They would knock on doors. Again, there's no alarm clock, so people were depending on the knocker-uppers to come by and knock on the door to make sure they were up and going in the morning and getting ready for work. That sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? But I am thinking this is exactly what God is calling us to do this year, in 2023. That we will be making sure that people are awake. We'll be making sure people are ready for the opportunities of this kingdom mission. That there are things that call for action and we're going to really lean into that. So how do you try to wake someone up? If they're struggling with complacency. And you know, I'm not sure I have, I'm not sure there is one answer to that question. But I hope that some of you today are hearing the alarm. 
It's getting your attention. I hope that's one of the ways God's been working in your life, that he's working through your circumstances and your situations to help you get a different perspective on this world, to help you see things through the lens of eternity. So we want to sound the alarm. We want to pound on the door. Because the whistle is blowing and the train is passing by, and we are not going to just gather together and sing louder to drown out what is going on around us. Because maybe this year, this may be the season, this may be the moment that tells the story of this church. Complacent or committed. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you modeled for us what committed love looks like when you died for us. You came to this earth, you sacrificed yourself, and you've called us to be a part of your mission. And I know, God, that for a lot of us, we've, we've just settled for comfort and convenience and complacency that that's become the goal of our lives for many of us. So I, I thank you, Jesus, that maybe you've taken some of those things away from us. You've, you've helped us realize how temporary many of those things are. And I pray that, that the alarm would sound, that we would have our eyes open to what you want to do in us and through us, and we would be a part of it, that we wouldn't just sit, but that we would engage and be a part of the mission you have for the church in this world. And I pray, Lord, that would start happening today, right now. I know complacency loves that word tomorrow. I know that's the word complacency is whispering to some people even now. Hey, next week, next month. But I pray, Lord, that we would hear your Holy Spirit saying to us today. Today is the day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you open your hymnals to number 605 and join in singing Living for Jesus, number 605. Um, If you need to stand up and stretch out, I encourage you to stand and sing together. If you're more comfortable seated, that's okay too. Let's just raise our voices in praise.
Be seated. As we come to a time of prayers of the people, I will ask if you've got joys or concerns that we might lift up to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, there are some special prayer concerns printed for you in the bulletin. Uh, again, continued prayer for Terry Williams McDonald as, as her cancer um, has come back with a vengeance. And uh, she is dealing with pain management and, and trying to uh, very holistically um, live her life to the best of her ability at this point. So keep her in your prayers. Also, please pray for our friend Mick Umshide, who uh, has had many complications with a gallbladder surgery. And um, while I, I want to assure you that he is not in a life-threatening position at this point, it's just kind of been a series of events. He uh, went in thinking a gallbladder surgery would be a, a relatively quick procedure, maybe overnight or even same day. And he's had an extended stay in the hospital at this point and had to undergo more than one procedure that involves anesthesia. And he's had a few medications administered to him as well that have uh, just made it for a bit lengthier stay than what they had anticipated. And uh, some, there again, uh, not critical, but um, troublesome concerns and complications that have come up with that. So keep Mick in your prayers, keep Bonnie in your prayers uh, and their family as he is uh, looking forward to recovering and being back with us here in church. So, Are there other joys or concerns that we might lift up in prayer this morning? Well, I've told you about my nephew <coughs> that's in the hospital um, in Rochester, and he'll be there for months. And he's, the good news is that he's now talking and walking a little bit, but he wants to go home, of course. Uh, but he um, is waiting for a, a heart transplant plant now. So he needs lots of prayers. I know this is a little bit early, but I'd like a joy. My brother, Carl, will be celebrating his 90th birthday on Friday. Well, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I am a month <laughs> Well, we're going to start celebrating now. <laughs> At 90, you get a whole month. <laughs> but we're not going to be complacent about that. We're going to celebrate every day for a month uh, as we approach a 90-year mark. We love it. Love it. Very good. I have a joy of family friend Jim Ladigard, who was the person that got, while he was walking, hit by a car. After five months in the hospital, he'll be coming home for home health care. Thank you. Very good. Any others? I will also draw your attention to that section in the bulletin where we offer you some suggestions during the week, who or what we might pray for, and that's usually a mix of uh, those in our church family, things that are happening in our community, in our world. Um, this week you're going to find a lot of our ministry teams listed in those prayer concerns uh, because we're, we're trying to also wake up our ministry teams to not be complacent, to pursue some mission ideas or some ways that we might be working and uh, again council meeting this week so keep this church family and the workings of it in your prayers um, hearing no others let's go to the Lord in prayer good morning God we fall at your feet we thank you we honor you, we praise you. How can we show people your glory, Lord? The way that you touch our hearts and, and fill us with your spirit is such a gift. And we ask that you would help us to advance your kingdom, the kingdom that you intended that you intend 
what that looks like, what that feels like. Give us the eyes of Jesus, the ears of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus to do your work. Lord, we have those that we've mentioned by name as well as those written on our hearts today that um, are just in our prayers. We we ask that you would hear us, that you would listen to us, that you would answer us, uh, that you would show us um, what it is you have in mind for us here. We, we so often, Lord, are, are overcome with, with happiness and joy in those times of celebration and, and even those quiet moments where we're just so thankful uh, for the people in our lives, for the things in our lives, for the gifts and the abilities that you have gifted us and for those around us. And Lord, we also have those moments, uh, just as, as any human life does, where we maybe go a little back and forth, where suddenly things can be troublesome, where we can have worries in our lives and anxieties in our lives where we have illness or we have loss or we just have trials and tribulations, Lord, that we need to overcome. And we're asking for your power to do that. Uh, As we lift up to you those who have um, medical issues, physical ailments in their lives, those who are, whether it's an emergency situation, whether it's an ongoing medical condition or, or a chronic condition that requires treatment, Lord, we're We're praying for those people that they will have stamina through you, that they will have courage and strength through your power. For those who have other types of ailments in their lives, aside from the physical, those emotional and spiritual, mental um, issues that come up that cause us so much distress and, and uncertainty, Lord, would you calm the waters for us in those areas, those troubles that happen at work or at school or in our relationships with one another, would you remind us who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, what you will do, and how you can do it through us. We praise you. We honor you. Thank you for being God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Oh. devotional moment as we prepare to dismiss this morning. If we are to live by the Spirit, we have to stop acting as if we are in control of our lives. We have to let ourselves be led by the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit that will help us become and be what the Lord wants us to be in the coming year. Use God's Word. Listen to what the Spirit is telling us. Pray each day to be filled by the Spirit, as Jesus himself assures us that God, who dearly loves us, will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Friends, what is God calling us to do? What is God calling you to do? Will you say yes? Will you be available to that? And then will you invite the Holy Spirit to fill you, to equip you, to use you for God's purposes. I pray that you will. And as you leave this place, I also pray that God and Father, Son, Holy Spirit, might lay his hand of blessing upon you, now and always. Amen. Let's stand and join in our closing hymn this morning. It's in the faith we sing, number 2153, I'm going to live so God can use me. 2153.